Good day and welcome to a new season of Hammer D20, the show that loves getting lost in fantastical new worlds. My name is Steven Solbot and I'll be your guide. Today we're going to focus on the newest and latest things happening in the board game community in Hamilton, starting with a visit to Hamilton's newest board game cafe, the Barden Bear. Located at the heart of Hamilton at 237 James Street North, the Barden Bear is a cafe where you can rent board games and play to your heart's content in a nice, cozy location that also sells cafe food like coffee and baked goods, and also is a licensed liquor and alcohol vendor, so you can also get beer and other alcoholic beverages here. At the time of filming, the store was only open for retail, but is hoping to allow guests in to sit down and play board games there, starting on January 31st at half capacity, uh, assuming Ontario COVID restrictions are loosened at that time. Regardless, I spoke to its owners, Stephen and Megan Edmonds, about their store, why they started it, their love for board games, and everything in between. Stephen, over to you. Uh, my name is Stephen Edmonds. Uh, I am the owner of uh, the Bard and Bear Games Cafe on James Street North in Hamilton. Megan Edmonds. I am the co-owner of the Bard and Bear Games Cafe. The Bard and Bear is a board game cafe, which means we are a venue where people can come and play games. We have almost 800 uh, board games that we can teach and recommend, and, and people can come and have a good time. And then we have food and drink and beer and wine for people to have even more of a good time. So we opened our doors to the public for the first time on December 10th. That was our grand opening weekend right at the tail end of 2021. Uh, Steven and I have been at work behind the scenes long before that, probably two years before that from inception to opening. We had to gather all the board games, find a space, get the permits, get the licensing, do the renovations. So there was a lot of work that went into it, but uh, open to play on December 10th. Uh, I was the manager at Mancala Monk for a long time, as you know, yeah. um, and I left there at a certain point to uh, pursue another job, and the owners of Mancala Monk reached out to myself and Megan um, sometime after that and said, hey, there's this board game cafe for sale in Guelph. Uh, now, I just started a new job, and Megan uh, was one year into her PhD, and it, the timing was just awful. But we still dropped everything to try and figure out how to make it work. And at the end of the weekend, we were going to go see the space and look at their books. And they called us and said that Snakes and Lattes had bought them. So we fortunately lost out on that place. But it caused us to look at each other and say, hey, is this something we seriously want to do? And that kind of started the process uh, that two, three years later, uh, we ended it up uh, renting out this place uh, on the awesome James Street North where there's this fantastic community and fantastic people and it took us a while to get started building because the city is super backlogged, uh, short-staffed and, and all the other things uh, to get our building permit but once we did we plowed straight ahead as quickly as possible getting paint on the walls and getting walls on the walls and uh, opened as soon as we could um, we were aiming for fall of 2021 and we uh, held on to the fact that fall technically ends on December 21st. <laughs> we love games and we love the ability for games to bring people together. We like creating a space where people can come together and bond in person and across the table from one another and I think over the last plus years People haven't had enough of that, haven't had enough opportunities to do that. And we want to provide a space where that's easy and where it's comfortable and where people can have a good time while playing some games. Megan and I are both big Dungeons and Dragons players uh, and we had two weekly games over the pandemic which had to move online. Yeah. And, you know, ostensibly it was the same thing, but it was not the same. Mm. Not being able to be at the same table as your friends, not being able to, you know, have that same in-person connection while you're playing the game, 
it's just not the same. Yeah. And so we we're really looking forward to bringing people back to the table once it's you know safe and responsible to do so. The thing I love about board games is that it gives you a shared activity. It doesn't matter who you're sitting around the table with. Doesn't matter how long you've known each other. You can find something that's going to be a lot of fun for you and bring you together. And chances are, get you laughing, get you mad at each other, but in a good way. Uh, they're just really good for community building. Excellent. Perfect. And what would you say is your favorite board game? My favorite board game, I would say, if I have to pick one, is Castles of Burgundy. Stephen did a whole bunch of research at one point and bought it as one that he thought I would love, and he was absolutely right. It remains one of my favorites. But when we're in a bigger group looking for something maybe a little less strategy heavy that can take more people, I really enjoy Once Upon a Time, which is a competitive collaborative storytelling game. Kind of similar to D&D if you strip away all of the dice and mechanics. Oh. And I also really love Monikers, which is just charades gone wild. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, the first one you mentioned, okay. Castles of Burgundy, what, what kind of game is that? Uh, so the Castles of Burgundy is your classic European style game, heavy strategy. Each turn you roll two dice and depending on what numbers come up, that dictates the sub actions you can take within the action categories and it's... Uh, it's a tile laying game technically, but there's some resource management going on and it's it's every European board game mechanic boiled down into a game all about building your little town, which I love. Uh, I'm definitely a big fan of what they'd call European style board games, but within that massive category, I really like tile laying games. I really like games where you are somehow acquiring tiles and then trying to uh, optimize the way that you're putting them down. That is a mechanic that I particularly love. Picking your favorite board game is always a challenging thing. It's like picking your favorite movie or your favorite book or your favorite song. Yeah. It depends on the situation, the people. Um, you know, Carcassonne uh, will always hold a special place in my heart uh, because it was the first game that Megan taught me uh, and one of the first like modern board games that I've ever played. Um, but, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, not quite a board game, but still uh, one of my favorite games. Uh, Codenames what is a fantastic party game and one of my favorite party games. So it really depends on the day, on the p people, but that's why we have 800 games. Because yeah. No matter what, we'll have the game that works well for the situation. I enjoy games that make me think, games, games where, you know, you're, you're trying to do something clever. Excellent, perfect. And then on the inverse, what would you say is your least favorite board game? If you oh Monopoly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I hate Monopoly. <laughs> yeah. Listen, it, it's fun. It's fun for kids, but it's a slow, depressing grind into bankruptcy, and I get enough of that in real life. So. <laughs> well, I play a game. If it's gonna happen yeah, anyway, man. like, it's, oh, what a game! <laughs> oh, this game's got real realistic graphics. What? Oh, it's just my life. Oh. <laughs> My least favorite board game, I will say that some of them that are just roll and moves, like snakes and ladders, things like that, where you don't really have control over what's happening. They absolutely have their place. You know, I, I recommend them for families with young kids. They're great to work on counting. Candyland is similar. You know, you flip the card and you go where it tells you, but it's good to work on colors. Those are great for learning fundamental skills. Once you've mastered those skills, not a lot of fun left in the game. So I would say those sort of base level ones are my least favorite personally. Oh, Literally, yeah. like in Snakes and Ladders, you roll and yes. then move the number it tells you to roll. In Candyland, you flip over a card and it's a color and you just go to the next base of that color. Uh, Ta-da! Yeah, it, it's, it definitely feels like a mid-century thing. They're like, it's Candyland. Kids, you It's can't super eat. cute. Yeah, and, yeah, it's, yeah. and it's genuinely, if you're a three-year-old learning your colors, it's great. Yeah. Other that. than that, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I, before we did this, we decided that one of us should probably go to school for business. Yeah. Um, Megan was already doing her PhD for fantasy literature, so it came down to me. So I went to uh, Mohawk for their small business course, um, and as part of that, we were tasked with coming up with a mission statement for this place. And our mission statement's very simple: it's just bringing people together at the table. That's it. We just want to bring people together. That's all for now. Back to you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Before we move on to our next segment, let's take a short break. See you soon.
Welcome back! So, before the winter break, I got introduced to a spicy new board game called Jabuka that was just recently made and has won all kinds of awards recently. Jabuka is a game where you spell words using these bean-shaped tiles. What makes these tiles special is that some of them work as different letters, depending on how you spin them and rotate them. E can be M, which can also be W. C can be N, and so on. You declare the words you want to spell first, then pull letters out of the pile to spell that word. That word is added to your score, and the player with the most beans at the end wins the game. However, I mean, well, I mean, I could keep going on, but I figure this tutorial video provided by the creators of Jabuka would provide you a better introduction to the game than anything I could do. So, over to you. Thank you for that. Hope that helped explain the game to some degree. So I spoke to Jabuka's creator, Martin Rosaki, about what the game's all about, why he made it, how that whole process was, and what he has planned for the future. Stephen, over to you. Yo, people in the house who love wordplay, I'm proud to present Jabuka today. With letters on coffee beans brewed to perfection, Jabuka requires face-to-face -face connection. It's a ritual, a tradition, a tabletop game in a mini jute bag with a pretty cool name. It's a patented invention with letters that twist. But the virtues go on. Allow me to list portability quick games anyone can play. It's a total brain workout. You can play all day. But lo and behold, it's the age of distraction. The digital world's getting all the action. Unplug your gadget. It's time to connect. Throw down some beans. Jabuka, respect. Hell yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> You're telling me earlier about the, that you had a rap. And I was like, whoa, what kind of rap are we talking about? I'm like, excellent. Uh, like, what's the, kind of the main goal of the game? Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's a word game. Uh, as I said in, in the rap on coffee, bean shaped pieces. The goal of the game is to make as many words as you can. So the player with the most words or beans that make up words wins. And it's super simple scoring. One bean is one point. Uh, so essentially you're making words and you're stealing them from your opponent at any time during the game. There's no turn taking, which is really cool. It's fun and fast. And everyone has control over the speed of the game because some of the beans, when you first spill them, pun intended, land face down. And then we all control the speed with a flip, flipping over two beans at a time until they're all flipped and then you just count who has more. So that's the essence of the game. It's super fun stealing people's words by twisting their letters, adding letters, and then rearranging their letters. Right, gotcha. I, I, obviously there's a, a kind of comparison, you probably make comparisons to Scrabble. Uh, however, it's not turn-based, is it? Yeah, so it's not turn-based. It's kind of like saying, you know, like grape juice and Chardonnay are the same thing. They're, you know, you can com compare them in the sense that they both come from grapes. So they're both, you know, Scrabble and Jabuka are both uh, word games, but the, the similarities kind of stop there. Uh, so there's no crosswords, there's no turn taking in, in Jabuka, and you can steal people's words. The scoring's super simple. So it's not like each letter has, you know, a different value. Um, yeah, they're two different games altogether, but they are word games. Something that came up when I first, you know, we first got, got in communications. Uh, it, personally, because I'm Serbian, uh, I, the word seemed familiar. And I, and I called yeah. in, in my previous episode, Jabuka. Uh, does Jabuka yeah. have a meaning? So, you know, it's funny. You're Serbian. I'm Polish Canadian. You know, in Eastern European, I think uh, the word is spelled that way with a J is pronounced like a Y. And it's like 
and it tends to mean apple in Eastern European. Yeah. So when I first came up with the uh, the name, I was looking for a fanciful trademark with no meaning in English. Um, and so in English, it doesn't really have a meaning when you pronounce it Jabuka. Uh, but I didn't know that how many Serbians, you know, Croatians, Poles, and other uh, Eastern Europeans would come by and say, "Hey." Uh, uh, there's an apple. You got apples for sale? No, it's um, it, it, you know, it's like Django Jumanji. I wanted to come up with uh, a name that sounded primitive, a little provocative, and kind of mystical. Um, and so uh, when I looked it up, it turns out both the meaning in Serbian and, and is apple, but also there's an island in the Adriatic that has a magnetic stone that twists the compasses of ships when they go by. And I was blown away because it was serendipitous, you know, the letters twisting and this, the compasses twisting. So, and I started to think, well, maybe I should uh, reach out to the rock and see if he'd be up for making a movie, you know, on Jabuka Island. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Uh, well, so uh, when did you start making this game? Yeah, so um, I, I thought of it a little while ago, but uh, we kind of launched it at the Toy Fair uh, in New York, um, you know, a couple of years ago, not not too long ago, just before uh, COVID, and we had an amazing response. Uh, so people really enjoyed it. I, you know, I'm proud to say everyone who's played it and that I talked to says it's their new favorite word game. So um, yeah, I'm very I'm very happy about that. Oh, okay, gotcha, guy. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, I get just how was that experience going to the New York Toy Fair? Oh, it's amazing. If, if you haven't been to a toy fair, I really recommend it. I mean, it's for the industry, but, uh, you know, maybe maybe a friend of a friend <laughs> related, you can get in. But, um, yeah, it's, it's all the greatest, uh, latest uh, new toys and games. And uh, it's good to see both uh, the competition and uh, to see, you know, kind of like what you're up against, but also to get inspiration. Um, and that's kind of how I got the inspiration for Jabuka is seeing all the word games out there. But I uh, was surprised to see they all have square pieces and most of them have crosswords. And I was thinking, you know, someone's got to think out of the box here. Not just uh, other games, but the fact that a lot of people were on their screens and still are, you know, and I, and I wanted to create a game that was, that was great for the whole family, that was accessible to everybody, um, that was pretty easy to understand, but had some sort of richness to it. And, and that was fast and fun and for people with short attention spans, that was educational. I mean, there were a lot of aspirations, but, but that's what I kind of wanted to do. Uh, I guess yourself is probably someone who's probably play tested the game a thousand times every day. Uh, are there yeah. any kind of secret strategies you discovered that we could be privy to? <laughs> um, so as far as the, um, the sort of, uh, secret, uh, s secret strategies, absolutely. Um, you know, in the game, uh, it is very fast and competitive. And to win, um, you don't have to be great at spelling. I, I personally am not very good at spelling. I'm really bad, actually. <laughs> so maybe that's why I invented the game. But um, so a lot of skills come to play. You could be good. You could be good at spe spelling. It will help, but it's not going to guarantee a win. Uh, you could be good at seeing things up to upside down about rearranging letters. You could be imaginative, uh, you could be quick, you could have good memory, all of those things come into play. And uh, so, for example, I would say when you're starting off, you want to make a big word that's really hard to steal. Because if you make short words, they're easy to steal. Um, also, you don't have to, uh, if you're feeling overwhelmed because there's a lot going on you know, in the game, you could just chill and watch people make words and then swoop in and steal their words. Oh. So that's really fun. I like to do that. That's like the Zen master approach. You just kind of sit there and then you just, you know, take one little uh, letter, you twist it, you steal the word. And it's so gratifying. Um, also there's blanks. Um, and those blanks are like jokers. They can be any letter and you can add them to somebody's word at any time. And I recommend holding on to your blanks until the end of the game, because that's when you can come in and really shift the tides and it'll make a difference. You know, someone might be up by, you know, five beans or five points and you come in and, and, and add your blank on the, ad, on the end, make it an S or something and steal that big word. So that's another uh, strategy uh, cool. I like to employ. Gotcha. Yeah, when I was seeing it, I was thinking exactly that of, uh, of like, you know, maybe let, let, the, let the worker ants do the work and then yeah. I will swoop yeah. in. The, oh, they, they spelt Sam or I'm going to put in same. Ah, ha, ha. And hopefully yeah, exactly. Goes, right. Yeah. Um, or somebody makes uh, someone's, you know, thinks they're smart and they make the word swimming, right? It's a long word, but actually swimming Lee is a word. Oh, so, oh yeah. Gotcha. They're so like, that's Whoa. where if you know, if you know, you know, if your vocabulary is a little richer, that can help as well. 
Excellent. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, when I bring this up with my buddies, I'll, I'll uh, study up on my <laughs> vocabulary and my uh, dictionary <laughs> skills. Um, yeah. For Do you have any future plans new or new game ideas? In the yeah, absolutely. This idea of twistability really opened up a creative can of worms. Um, and so, for example, being able to redefine the familiar in a new way, to see things differently, upside down, sideways, uh, to question the meaning of things. All of that, I think, is uh, is fertile ground for uh, creating new games. So uh, we are going to make a jumbo-sized version of the game or a bigger one as well um, that's uh, accessible for, for younger kids and, and also for people who might be a little visually impaired. Um, and then also we have a dice game that uh, we want to um, launch next year. And then a, a bunch of other uh, ideas in the pipeline that relate to seeing things differently. If we were interested in buying ourselves a copy of Jabuka, where can you get one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you can get Jabuka at jabukagames.com. Uh, and uh, it's, it, as you can see, it makes a great uh, stocking stuffer. <laughs> it's, uh, you can even hang it on your tree. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, because got, you got the little burlap sack with the little rope, and it just it kind of hangs anywhere. It's, it's like in terms of storage, it's just it's perfectly just just compact enough that you could put it anywhere, right? So yeah, uh, perfect. that's the uh, idea. Is, is there anything else you'd like to mention before we kind of close off? I hope if you get a game of Jabuka, you enjoy it with your family because um, it's a lot of fun. It's totally twisted fun. <laughs> perfect. Thanks, Martin. Thank you for coming on and thank you for your time. I'll uh, just throw it back to you, Stephen. Thank you for your time, Martin. And thank you, Stephen, for speaking to him. You're a great interviewer. Ha ha ha. Anyway, that's all the time we have for Hayward D20. If you yourself want to be involved in the show or want to be a guest or want me to cover an event, you can contact me through Cable 14's homepage through the Get Involved portal. All you got to do is go to Cable 14, click Get Involved, click either Guest Appearance or Event Coverage, and fill out the form. If it's the Guest Appearance form, you can mention that you want to be guest on Hayward D20, and my producers will get in contact with me, and then I'll get in contact with you. I'd love to talk about anything you have going on, whether you invented a new toy or you, 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 you won a tournament or something like that, or there's a cosplay event or, hell, I'm not even sure why. I, there's so many things. If you have anything, let me know. And I'd love to get in word with you. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you hopefully sooner than later.